from a tiny seed sown by Christ springs forth a tree, but not just any kind of tree. As it is said in the book of Isaiah, Christ came to console those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes so that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. As I said in last week's sermon, I say to you today, no gardener likes to see their plants growing in the garden, but not bearing any fruit. The Lord, I tell you today that the Lord is a planter and he plants his seed for a great purpose. The Lord, he desires to see that seed grow into again, not just any kind of a tree. The Lord desires to see that seed grow into a righteous tree. And I ask all of you today, are you a righteous tree of God? Something that I don't believe we realize is just how much the Lord loves trees. I don't think any of us have ever really thought about God loving trees, but I say to you today that trees are actually very significant. They are very special to the Lord. Now, some of you, you may look at me like I'm talking kind of crazy right now. The past couple of weeks, I've talked about a seed, and now today I'm talking about a tree. You may be thinking, what's going on, Pastor? Why are we talking about trees all of a sudden? But again, I tell you that trees, they truly are special to the Lord. When we think about it, when we think about gardens, since I've been talking about gardens as well the past couple of weeks, when we think about gardens and we think about God, I believe that our minds will think about Eden right away. We'll think about that garden that scripture tells us that the Lord planted eastward in Eden. Now, typically when someone tells us that they have a garden or that they are a gardener, we will ask them, well, what do you plant? What is in your garden? In Eden, in the second chapter of Genesis, scripture tells us that in the Lord's garden in Eden, there was a river that parted into four and ran throughout the garden. So there was a river that was in Eden. There were four rivers that was in Eden. The standout feature that was in Eden is one that was very interesting because, again, when we think about gardens, we think about the standout feature being roses or tulips or lilies or, you know, some kind of some kind of flowers. But. We are told in Eden that flowers weren't the main feature. Scripture tells us that the trees of Eden were the main feature. Scripture plainly states that the Lord made every tree grow in the garden. It does not focus in on flowers. The ninth verse of the second chapter of Genesis tells us that the trees that the Lord made grow in the garden, they were pleasant to the sight and they were good for food. Then in that same chapter of Genesis, we are told that in the midst of the garden, that there stood two trees that were again central to the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then the tree of life. Now, elsewhere in scripture, we're told of another garden and this garden, it is actually in heaven and it is known as the paradise of God. And guess what appears there in the midst of that garden? In the second chapter of Revelation and the seventh verse, we're told that in the midst of that garden stands the tree of life. Trees, again, I tell you that they are very special to the Lord. So one may ask, well, how special are trees to the Lord? Well, the father, he likened his only begotten son to guess what? A tree. That's just how special trees are to the Lord. In the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and the second verse, the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah that the Messiah, that Christ would grow as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. 
It is then recorded in the 15th chapter of John's gospel that Jesus said that he is the true vine. Trees, I tell you today, that they are so highly valued in God's eyes that we find in the first psalm, in the first three verses of the first psalm, that David, he likened all of those who delighted in the way of God, he likened us to being like a tree. You see, I believe that David, he understood very well the Lord's love of trees. So one may ask again, why are trees so special? Why are trees so special to God? Why would God desire for you to be like a tree? Well, to answer this question, let's think more about trees here for a moment. You know, in your mind, what is the, the first thing that you begin to think of when you think about trees? Personally, myself, when I think about trees, I think of their beauty. That's the first thing that I think of. From spring bloom to their peak pristine green colors in the summertime, all the way up to fall time when, again, I feel like trees really shine during the fall where we see those peak, beautiful fall colors. Trees, they are absolutely stunning. The second thing that I think of when I think about trees is you can't miss them. They are huge. They are tall. You, 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 you couldn't miss them if you tried to miss them. The, the third thing that I think of when I think about trees is the fact that they are very resilient. I don't know if you understand what I mean by that when I say that, but trees, they are very resilient and in the harshness of winter. They look as dead as that doorknob. Yet when springtime rolls around and they get a hint of warm weather, guess what that tree starts to do? It starts to wake up again and that tree, it starts to blossom. It was never dead in the first place. In their resilience, trees, they, they live for a very long time, don't they? There are trees that are around today that were around when Jesus walked the earth. I don't know if you all know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, trees are very special. They are very special to the Lord. They should be very special to us. When I consider all of those things about trees, I consider even more what they do, what they provide for us. In case you happen to forgotten trees, they give us life. I don't know if you all remember the science classes that you had in school, but in, in science, I, I remember being taught about how trees, they absorb carbon dioxide out of the air and they produce the oxygen that all of us need to breathe in in order to be able to live. In the heat of summer, you can stand up under a tree and again, you can find shade up under its cover. If you happen to be hungry and you buy a tree that maybe is a pecan tree, you can eat from that tree. If you happen to be by a tree that happens to be an apple tree, guess what? you can eat from that tree. So again, trees, they, they are very special to the Lord and they better be very special to you. You better, you better uh, recognize that tree. You better acknowledge it. You better respect that tree because that tree, it is a giver of life. Again, I would say to you today that if trees are special in general, I would tell you that spiritually speaking, trees are incredibly important that they are incredibly special. So in looking at how special trees are, again, the Lord has said that we should be like a tree. And so again, one may ask, why does the Lord desire for us to become a tree of righteousness? Now, I have spoken about Eden and I have briefly mentioned the paradise of God, which is in heaven. But in order for us to be able to answer this question today, 
we must take a look at one more garden. There is one more garden that is very significant for us today that we must take a look at. The garden that I am now speaking of, it is that same field, that same garden that we saw in my sermon last week, where we were told, where we saw in my sermon last week that Jesus, he went out into a field and in that field, scripture told us that he scattered, that he sowed seed on the ground. Guess what Jesus was trying to grow? Guess what the Lord was trying to grow? So again, we know that that field from our sermon last week, from the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, we know that that field was representative of the world. And so that next garden that we are going to focus on now is the world. The world, I want you to understand that the world is the Lord's garden as well. As we saw in the parable of the sower last week, the world, it is a rather difficult place to be trying to grow a garden in, especially when we are speaking spiritually here. If you think about it, that garden, that field, only a fourth of it was any good for trying to grow a garden. I don't know if you all remember this, but let us again think about it. The rest of that garden, it was either filled with stony ground or thorny ground, or it was at the edges of the field and every garden has an edge. Neither of those surfaces, neither three of those types of surfaces, 75% of that garden, none of it was good for trying to grow what the Lord desired to grow. And again, God desires to grow a tree that is righteous. So in this world, the Lord said that 75% of this world ain't good for trying to grow a tree of righteousness. Not only was the field terrible, but when we look back at that parable, the sun was spoken of and how it could scorch the seeds trying to grow on stony surfaces. So I would tell you that the conditions of that field, the seasons of that field, the weather of that field, if you will, it wasn't any good as well. It was probably even worse than the field itself. Most gardeners, I believe, had they taken a look at the field and they saw the, the conditions of the soil of that field, I believe that they would have passed it on by. They would have said, hey, it ain't worth it trying to go out into that field and trying to sow any seed. Just that little bit of the field is any good. And any of the gardeners that may have been brave enough to try to go out into the field to sow seed, they would have realized that the weather is terrible, that the seasons are harsh. And guess what? They would have passed it by as well. But the Lord, our God, he is different. He isn't like us. We know that the Lord's thoughts, we know that the Lord's ways, that they are far greater than our ways. They are higher than our ways. You see, the Lord, he is long suffering. And so where some would have given up on us, where some would have given up on the world, God, he did not give up on the world. And so I would say to all of you today, God, he did not give up on us. In other words, God, he did not give up on you. That is why his only begotten son came into this field that is our world and he scattered seed. Because God, he did not give up on us. You see, when we take a look at our world, we know that this world ain't any good. We talked about it in my Sunday school lesson last week. We, we know the conditions of this field. We know the wickedness of mankind, in other words. We know our penchant for transgressing against one another. 
And if we'll do wrongly by each other with absolutely no care in the world, we will do wrong by God. We will transgress against him. The field is a field of sin. In other words, this world, as we know, it is a wicked place. This world is a world of sin. And with the world being the world of sin as it is, I would tell you today that the conditions of this world, it is always trying to destroy people like us. In fact, I would tell you that this world is just trying to destroy everybody. Anything growing in the field, this world, it is trying to kill. It is trying to destroy. In other words, the world is trying to kill and destroy your soul. So here again, in the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, there in my key verses, the seventh and the eighth verse, we'll see that the Lord, he has encouragement for us. The Lord, he encourages us to trust in him, not anybody else. The Lord, he encourages us to trust in him. And, and the Lord said that in those verses that if we were to do so, we will be blessed. We will be happy. We will be content in our soul. That is what the Lord has said there. Those that trust in the Lord, God has said there in my key verses again, that we will be like a planted tree. Planted there. I want all of you to see the significance of the fact that God said that we are a planted tree. I want all of you who trust in the Lord to know today that you are not some loose. You are not some wild growing plant in that field. In other words, you are not some wild growing vine like Kutzu or Wisteria. You, you're not something that is loosely planted in the world today. You are a well planted tree that has been planted by Christ that separates you from anything else that is growing in the field. If you're going to endure the terrible seasons that is this world, I say to you today that you must be well rooted. I don't know if you understand what I mean by that. If you are going to make it in this world, you must be well rooted. You must have a firm and a solid base, a firm and solid foundation. Now, again, there in the key verse, God tells us that his trees, that they are not only planted, but they are well planted. They are well planted because they have been planted by Christ by the waters, the Lord said. They have been planted by the waters so that their roots can spread out by the rivers. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means, but that is truly special for the seed that Christ had scattered and sown for it to have been planted by water by the rivers. Now let us understand here today that these rivers, they aren't flowing from water that is of the world. These rivers, I want you to understand today that these rivers, they are flowing from God. These rivers, I want you to understand that these rivers, that they are holy rivers, that they are righteous rivers. Now, this, again, it is confirmed for us in the 55th chapter of Isaiah and the 10th verse, where God stated that his word is as the rain that comes down and as the snow that falls from heaven. You see, as we know, the precipitation of rain and snow that falls down from our sky, it helps to replenish the lakes 
that is of this world. It causes the rivers to flow that is in this world. You see, it is the rain that falls. It is the snow that falls that, that nourishes our world today, that waters the earth so that we can see the beautiful trees that grow in the forest so that our flowers that are in our gardens so that they can burst open. And so the vegetables and the fruits that we have growing in, in our fields so that they can rise up and grow as well. So the word of God, I want you to understand today that it is like the rain and the snow that, that nourishes the world, except that the word of God, it rains down on us. And therefore, it nourishes us, the righteous trees of God. May I suggest to you today that because the roots of God's trees are being fed by the holy and the righteous word of God, may I suggest to you that his trees, that they are well-fed trees? I believe that the trees of God, that they are well-fed Therefore, I would tell you that a tree of God, that it is built to be able to endure. The righteous tree of God, it is built to be able to endure the harshest of seasons in this world. Whatever this world can throw at the tree of God, the tree of God, it is built to endure. You, because you trust in the Lord today to not speak figuratively anymore. I want you to understand today that you are built to endure. Again, I ask you today, are you a tree of God? So as trees are resilient in general, the tree of God, I want you to understand today that it is also incredibly resilient. Again, they're in my key verses, the seventh and the eighth verse. The Lord states that his trees, that they don't fear when he comes. Nor are they anxious in drought because they are again planted beside those rivers. You see, the roots of God's trees, they have an endless supply of life. They have an endless supply of nutrients and minerals flowing from those rivers that their roots are, are flowing and running over into. The endless supply of food means that God trees, they remain in not just good health. God trees, they remain in great health. Even in the harshest of seasons, the trees of God, they remain in great health. Now, when I, when I first planned to preach this sermon a couple of months ago, now it may be longer than that. Now these verses, these two verses, this statement here, it, it really caused me to, to think for a moment. And I went to my patio door and as I often do, I looked at, at my yard, it had barely even began to green yet, but I took a look at the trees and I noticed my trees, how the wind was blowing and how the trees, they was just swaying back and forth, rocking back and forth. And I looked at the base of, of my trees, the one that we nicknamed after our first dog, Mac, I call it Max tree. And I tell you that, that the trees in, in the backyard, they are, in my opinion, very solid trees very strong bases, most of them. However, as strong as I like to think that they are, when the heat of summer has reached this boiling point, you know how it gets here in Georgia when we get down into August, mid to late August. When it has reached its worst and we stop getting much rain, I start to see leaves falling off of the trees. It ain't gotten cold outside yet. And the leaves, as they fall down into my pristine green yard that I like to brag about, those leaves, they look very discolored. They ain't all that green anymore. It is a sign that those trees needed some more rain. 
that they needed some more water. That again, the tree wasn't in as great of health as it could have been in. In life, we know for certain that we all have good and that we all will go through some bad seasons. We, in other words, we have our ups and, and we have our downs. We know that we are going to have our struggles there. There's no avoiding that. All of us, we have our afflictions, whether they are physical afflictions, mental afflictions, emotional or spiritual afflictions as well. Yet the Lord said that if we put our trust in him, if we believe in him, if we have faith in him, the Lord has said that we will remain in great health. The Lord said that the leaves of our trees, they won't become discolored because of the heat. But because the roots of us are flowing into the rivers, that is the word of God, the Lord has said that our leaves will remain green. You will be in good health. You are in great health when you diligently are feeding off of the word of God. Spiritually speaking, a tree that is not in constant supply by the rivers of God, it is a tree whose leaves don't remain green. That's what the Lord implies for us there in my key verse for today. Those trees that are not being fed by the word of God is a tree whose base won't be firm and solid and wide, strong. It is a tree that will begin to wither. And when the storms of life press against it, and when the seasons of this world, as random as they change and as harsh as they can be, began to weigh down on that tree, it'll fall. It'll topple over because its foundation, its base, its roots were thin and weak. This is why the Lord desires for us to become a tree of righteousness. As a tree of God, the Lord certainly desires for us to remain standing upright in the world. However, there is a greater purpose. There is another great desire that the Lord has for all of us as his trees. You see, the great purpose, it is said to us there in my key verse for today again. As we take a look there at the seventh and the eighth verse, the Lord said through the prophet that the righteous tree, it has been planted by the waters so that it does not cease from yielding fruit. Do we all see that there? Let us understand that the righteous tree of God, it doesn't just survive in the harshest of seasons. The righteous tree of God, it lives and it thrives in the harshest of seasons. You see, it thrives. It, it, it is bearing fruit in a world that all it is trying to do is kill the poor old tree. You see, to thrive means to grow vigorously. To thrive, it means to flourish. The righteous tree of God, it flourishes and it bears fruit in a world where it shouldn't even be happening in the first place. In this world of sin, if you are a righteous tree of God, the Lord has said that you are not only going to remain upright, but there is fruit that you should be bearing. As I said at the start of my sermon here, no gardener likes to see their plants growing in the garden, but not producing any fruit for harvest. God, I want you to understand today that the Lord, he planted you so that you can not only grow in this world, but so that you can bear fruit in this world. And so I would ask all of you today, are you bearing fruit in this world? Now, Jesus, he spoke of this great desire 
when he said there again in the 15th chapter of John's gospel and the first verse that he is the true vine, but he added on there in that verse that the father is the vine dresser. As the vine dresser, Jesus, he pointed out there in the second verse of the 15th chapter of John's gospel that the father takes away every branch in Christ that does not bear any fruit. Now, as you have heard me say before about that, that verse there, this statement, it has nothing to do with one losing salvation as salvation has been promised and guaranteed to all of those that genuinely believe all of those that genuinely believe in the Lord will not lose their salvation. However, the removal of these branches that aren't bearing any fruit is part of the father's upkeep of his garden. Jesus, he also stated there in that same second verse that the father is pruning. He's taking away those branches that aren't bearing any fruit, but at the same time, he's pruning the fruit bearing branches. You'll see there. So why is the Lord doing this? Why, why is God doing this to the true vine, to all of us who are growing in his garden. You see, the Lord, he is doing this, I want you to understand, because of that greater purpose for which he planted us. Again, that great purpose is for us to bear much fruit. The Lord wants you to bear fruit in this world. You see, gardeners, they, they prune their plants for a few reasons. Firstly, a gardener, they will cut away the parts of the plant that may be unhealthy or may even be dead. The gardener will do this to give way to the parts of the plants in their garden that is healthy and living so that that plant can again live and thrive. The second reason why a gardener will prune their plants is to again make room for the parts that are trying to bloom, the parts that are trying to bud. See, in, in this case, we find that the Lord is doing this so that the branches that are bearing fruit can spread out even more and bear more fruit. That's just how much the Lord desires for all of us to be bearing fruit in the world today. So to not speak figuratively here, the Lord prunes us. He takes away our unhealthy parts. He takes away your dead parts so that you can continue to flourish so that you can continue to grow so that you can vigorously bear more and more fruit. Again, that's why the Lord planted you in the first place. Again, the primary purpose of the righteous tree of God is to bear much fruit. Are you bearing fruit today? Sadly, many of God's trees today aren't bearing much fruit. As I said a few Sundays ago, many of us, we are too afraid to get up on top of our houses and let the world know about the Lord. Many of us, we may simply not be able to do what we once was able to do. And the Lord, he will remove us from bearing any more fruit because we aren't doing it. He'll move us out of the way. He'll say to us, job well done, my good and faithful servant. But on the other hand, some of us, we simply aren't moving today. We aren't moving to, to bear any fruit. We aren't moving as we ought to be moving. Those of us who are capable and able to bear fruit we should move in a manner to where we are actually doing just that, bearing fruit in our world. So one may ask, well, how do I do this? What is the holy and the righteous fruit that I ought to be bearing in this world? We're in the fifth chapter of Galatians and in the 22nd and the 23rd verse, we'll see that Paul said in his letter to the Galatians that the holy and the righteous fruit born from the spirit, born from the word of God. It is love. It is joy. It is peace. It is long suffering. It is kindness. It is goodness. It is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
That is how you bear fruit in this world today. In order to bear the holy and righteous fruit, Jesus said that we must be connected to him, the true vine. In the fifth and in the sixth verse, there in the 15th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said that if a branch does not abide in him, if it ain't attached to him, if it's not growing off of him, then that branch, it will never bear any fruit that is holy and righteous. As Jesus said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So in order for you, in order for us to bear the fruit that is holy, to bear the fruit that is righteous, we must be connected. We must be attached to Christ. If you desire to bear fruit in this world, make sure you are connected to Christ. When Israel was living sinfully, the Lord said to them, learn to do good. In the 17th verse of the first chapter of Isaiah, when, when the Lord told them this, we'll see what God considered to be good. Good to the Lord was seeking justice. Good to the Lord was rebuking the oppressor. Good to the Lord was defending the fatherless and pleading for the widow. In other words, good to the Lord was considered helping those who were in need of helping, uplifting those who were unable to uplift themselves. That was what God considered to be doing good. That is what we should consider to be bearing fruit, good fruit in our world today. You see, this is the greater purpose of the righteous tree of God to not simply live for ourselves, but to live, to be a blessing to all of those that are around us. Are you being a blessing in our world today? That is what you ought to be asking yourself. We should ask ourselves, are we bearing love? Are we bearing joy? Are we bearing peace in our world or are we moving to choke the world out? Are we moving to choke out and tear down those who may be growing in the world today as well? We must answer that question. The word of God, it has been planted. And I tell you today that the word of God, it has not only been planted, but the word of God, it sustains us so that we can go out and so that we can give life to all of those that are around us. As trees release oxygen for us to breathe, those around us, I tell you today, spiritually speaking, when they come around you, they should be able to breathe as well. I don't know if you understand what I mean there by that. We should be the oxygen for all of those that are around us. Trees, they give life. Guess what we should be doing in our world today, spiritually speaking? Spiritually speaking, we should be giving life to all of those that are around us. You see, as a righteous tree of God, we should provide cover and shelter for those who need cover and shelter from this world of wickedness. Again, as a tree of righteousness today, I tell you that we should be providing food, sustenance for all of those that are around us as well. So that they, again, can not only live, but so that they could be sustained as they try to make it in this world. God encourages us to be a tree of life in a world that needs more life. Some of us believe that the word of God was planted in us for soul winning. But I tell you today that soul winning, it can't happen if you ain't bearing any fruit. I feel I need to, to repeat myself there. Some of us believe that we are supposed to be in the world winning souls. But I tell you today that you can't win any souls 
if you are not bearing any good fruit. If you're not bearing the holy and the righteous fruit of God, you're not going to save any souls. You see, soul winning, that is the end result of when we bear fruit. I tell you today that, again, we should continue to feed off of the word of God. We should continue to feed off the word of God so that we can not only be resilient, but so that we can bear much fruit. The Lord doesn't look for us to bear a little fruit. The Lord doesn't look for us to bear some fruit. Scripture repeatedly tells us there in the 15th chapter of John's gospel that the Lord looks for us to bear much fruit. Fruit coming from us should be in abundance. See, if we continue to feed off the word of God, then I tell you today that we will thrive not just for ourselves, we will thrive for all of those that are around us. They will have an opportunity to live. They will have an opportunity to thrive as well. To all of you who are of the world, I encourage you today to find a tree of God. And when you find that tree of God, I encourage you to taste and see that the holy and the righteous fruit of God truly is good. Amen. 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 Amen.